Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so there's this mission of divine mercy out of Texas that is causing a big uproar in the church for a lot of reasons that we're going to get into. People are worried about a chastisement. Is the warning coming? Is the three days of darkness coming? There's a lot of chatter about this eclipse, which is coming apparently right after Divine Mercy Sunday. And this all kind of plays into that. I have stayed away from commenting on this because it just kind of seems like a, a rat's nest to get into. Um, but I'm going to comment on it here because I've been asked a ton and I figure I might as well do it. This is the last video that I'm going to post for about 10 or 12 days with the Holy Triduum coming up and all these sorts of things and Easter Easter Tide and the Octave of Easter. I'm just going to take a break from technology, throw my phone in a drawer, put my computer away, go back to living in the 90s and all we have is a house phone. Uh, we don't have a TV, so it's going to be a wonderful, a wonderful time with my family. And I recommend you do the same thing. If you are still online uh, throughout the Holy Triduum, please take a, a look for my channel. I do have, I should say this is the last video I'm recording, but I do have some pre-recorded finishing up of my gospel series, the Holy Gospel according to St. John. If you do want to listen to something uh, for meditating on Good Friday, the Passion and Death of Our Lord, and also Easter Sunday, I have recorded the accounts of those from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, which is my favorite gospel. And I think you'll find them moving if you want something to listen to. So take a look out for those. And uh, okay, so we're going to talk about this divine mercy uh, mission thing. They've been suppressed by their bishop. There's talk of God's action coming soon, all these kinds of things. We're going to do a deep dive into what has been said and also how we should be looking at things like private prophecy, because that's really the question at hand, especially when it comes to this idea of disobedience to the bishop and so on and so forth. Now, before I do that, my good friends, I have a good friend named, well, his name is Fawaz, but his stage name is Enoch. He is a musician and he makes rap music as well as some other types of music. Now, not everyone is a rap fan. I personally don't listen to rap in my personal life anymore. I used to a lot growing up, but I stopped in the last five or six years and haven't really in a long time. Uh, however, he did just release a, a wonderful song that I think is palatable and enjoyable for even those who are non-rap fans, because I understand many of the traddies aren't really into rap, and I get that. I, again, I don't listen to it in my personal life, but Enoch is very talented. He's a very wonderful lyricist, and the song is quite musical and moving, very melodic, and it's, it's very poetic. It's almost more like him reading an, ex, an, a, a, an, a, an astounding sort of ballad or poem over some very intense and moving uh, melody in the background without any really driving beat. So I'm going to, I want to give my friend a shout out here and I want you to support him because he is a Catholic artist and I'm going to play his song here and we're going to sort of react to it together. And then I'm going to get into the heart of what I'm going to talk about regarding the divine mercy mission thing. So I'm just going to pull up his song here. It's only a couple minutes long, and it's really beautiful. And then we'll get into the heart of the show. So check out Enoch's channel. Uh, you can look it up. You can see it when I bring it up on the channel. I'll, I'll put it in the links, uh, the description box for this podcast. Um, so here is his song. It's called The Passion, and it is a beautiful song. And I'm really proud of him for doing it. I think he did a wonderful job, and he's a really, really great man. Um, he really is. I should probably uh, do this. Okay. He's a really great man, and um, let's listen to this together. Chanting and chattering, chains rattling, gather them like cattle while assassins ready for battle. Pharisees have had it, demand exchange with Barabbas. The range practice, the range by those in high status. While his fabric is tattered, blood stains on his habit. Half the crowd is cowardice, other half chant crucify him savages. It so happened, it's so fast, but for me it's a slow mo. A pilot stands, extends his hands, and proclaims, Edge your homo. Next thing you know, he's condemned to let this slaughter. I follow far behind in horror. Half the crowd is weeping, other half is applauding. Weight of the cross was so heavy, the crown of thorns held down. I'm 
soldiers beat him so bad that he stumbled and fell down Then a woman approached him with a white cloth Wipes his bloody face with some of the skin came right off I moved closer for a better position She offered a drink, denying permission I guess he was the physician who healed the blood condition When she appears out in the distance A radio woman approaching the victim She kneels down in front of him, what a picture I read his lips, I make all things new Then the soldiers kicked him I asked who this is, someone shouted That's, That's his mother my heart flooded, I froze No mother should witness the son better than be to treat her like sheep The balance, a lady of sorrow, she keeps in silence She wrapped her arms around him and held him for a while It felt familiar, the type of comfort the only mother can give her own child They grabbed her hands to clear his face Pick up your cross, keep moving, cursing and whipping him Spit in his face, no justice, I'm raging My frustration, I'm patient, heart's racing I'm wasting time, why don't anybody here put an end to this fallacious crime? I'd rather die a hero than live as a coward I make my way through the crowd Squeezing, I'm freezing, heavy breathing I'm so close, I can smell the bleeding I'm saving him, I don't care if I die for treason I make this from the scene again, I freeze Why is my name on the street? Every sin I'm involved, every word Need a thought, as in this cross He took one look at me, then rose to his feet Then I realized this is all happening Because of me Wow. Very moving, very beautiful. Christ was crucified because of our sins. And we should all remember that. Enoch, man. I have to take some allergy medication because uh, there's some dust in this room and it's making my eyes watery. How dare you do that to me? Congratulations, my friend. What a beautiful song. And uh, honestly, it's hard to find words. Christ was crucified because of our sins. Get to confession. Get to mass. Live in a state of grace. Because we owe that to Christ. Enoch, why are you doing this to me? Goodness gracious, buddy. All right. Congratulations again. Okay, let's move on before I start getting really bad allergies here. And um, Sam, when you see this in the chat later, make sure you send us that Andrew Tate thing where he makes a joke about crying. I can't stand Andrew Tate, but it's a funny quote. All right. So what's going on with this divine mercy thing? So a little background. I'm not going to give too much, but just enough. Okay. So basically, uh, I don't know, about a month ago or so, a month and a half ago, these uh, alleged apparitions started coming out of this divine mercy mission. So you can see this divine mercy mission of divine mercy. It's from Texas. We're going to go into this page in a second here. And I'll make this bigger so everybody can see this properly. So on February 28th, they, they published these uh, alleged apparitions. And it's a prophetic message, et cetera, et cetera. The na father's name is Father John Mary. He seems like a very pious individual. I'm, this is not a, an attack on any persons. I just want to go over this. And so there's some, some interesting things here. So God's plan, this is God speaking, asking for the reconquest of the hearts of my children, of my church, and of all creation which for so many years has been under the domination of my enemy, so that what is mine may be restored to the beauty and holiness I intended for it from the beginning. That's great. That's, that's, that's a beautiful message. I have no problem with that. And another message from God allegedly, <clears throat> I speak to you from this throne of mine, this little hill on which I shall, sh will, shall show my power and love. And the idea is that this place where they are is, as we'll see here from this alleged message of the Blessed Mother, from my new Tepeyac. If you don't know Tepeyac, that's where the our apparitions of Our Lady of Guadalupe, it's a, it's a mount in Mexico City. I've been there twice, special place. I owe my entire life to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and it's my favorite. It's, it's, it's my favorite thing ever. And he says, yes, new, she said yes, allegedly she. <clears throat> yes, new for from here will flow the great river of grace to reconquer all of the children of God from this little piece of land hidden rough I call you out once more. I'll call out to you once more. And there's lots of information here from, <clears throat> excuse me, about this whole mission thing. Um, now here's, well, one thing we should address. Okay, if it's not true that this is from heaven, 
then there is a little bit of confusion here saying that this is another Guadalupe. That's kind of a big deal. Guadalupe was accompanied by extremely well, astounding miracles, the Tilma and especially, and that has been investigated for centuries, and it's a miraculous image. That's another thing to look into. So if there's an, alleg an allegation, I guess you could say, or, or if it's alleged that this is the new Guadalupe, then you're going to have to bring some proof because you can't just say that. Um, okay, back to it quick. <clears throat> then immediately in this, they address the question of the hierarchy. It says, let me address another question many might be asking. What about the hierarchy's role in discerning these matters? Normally, as Catholics, we should be able to trust the discernment of the pastors of the church. Agreed. But these are not normal times. Agreed. Discernment calls for sound theology, but it, is especially, but it especially calls for the simple childlike faith of the gospel. I agree with this. Um, so the terrible crisis of the faith and the corruption in the church have made many pastors unable or unwilling to recognize the Holy Spirit speaking today. I agree with that, but you got to be careful as if you know you have the key to understanding that. I'm not a theologian or a scripture scholar or a canonist. I'm just a priest, but I've had 30 years of intense on-the-job training by the Holy Spirit in discerning and cooperating with prophetic graces. I willingly and wholeheartedly give my personal witness to the authenticity of these messages. Okay. A little bit problematic, but also very understandable. Now, here's the thing. At a certain point, uh, these messages kept coming. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a join to join my army, a call to bishops and priests received on February 22nd, published on March 6th. And here is where things get interesting that we should discuss. Okay, so this one's lengthy. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. There's a lot of good stuff. It says to my children scattered throughout the world, your God speaks to you from the little holy hill, our new Tepeyac. Again, if it's not true, then that's an astounding claim. The time has come, my children, to call you to join yourselves to my army, the army what, that I have found, formed and forged in silence in what is hidden what, with countless trials, sacrifices, and sufferings. If the idea is that this is where the army is found, again, pretty big deal if it's not verified. How many small battalions I have formed throughout the world on each continent as cisterns of pure water to give life to my hungry and abandoned children hungry for the truth, hungry for me, and abandoned by those who have become a stumbling block for me. My priests, sons, to whom I have given the mandate and mission to care for my sheep, to protect them and nourish them with my sacred food. To be honest, a lot of the stuff I agree with. But these shepherds have fallen asleep and have abandoned you. That's true, my children, the vast majority of them. I have faithful shepherds, the joy of my heart, who united to my Jesus, work ceaselessly to guide my sheep into my fold, and how they are hated and persecuted. This is true. They will receive the crown of martyrdom for this witness and work in my honor. My voice is about to thunder in order to awaken my sleeping children, drunk with the world and with Satan's lies. So here is where we have to discuss something. This is an alleged prophecy, not just a revelation. So not only is God speaking to this, these seers, allegedly, but this is also a prophecy about something is going to happen. Well, that's a whole other claim. Let's continue. Um, they do not recognize the times. They do not recognize my voice, and they are useless to me. That is very problematic. Even the worst priest in the world is not useless to God because he can offer the sacrament of confession. If you're dying on the side of the road and a Ted McCarrick goes by, he can hear your confession. That's not useless. So that's that's very imprecise. God is not imprecise. Continuing. You have called me and I come. You have been faithful and now I show you that I am your faithful God. Faithful to my word, faithful to my truth, faithful to my love for you. Okay, lots of this stuff. It's great. Raise your hearts. Don't be afraid. Beautiful. Okay, then it's continued. So here is where I'm just going to do a um, uh, search here. So it goes down and... So I must correct you, it is mercy. I must wake you up, it is mercy. I must shake you, it is justice. To be honest, coming from the divine mercy milieu, which sometimes seems to emphasize mercy over justice, I, correction is merciful. So again, I agree with that. I am your father and I have mercy, but I'm also your king and I demand your loyalty and your obedience. 
I always get weird. I always get nervous when the obedience word comes up in the post-conciliar world because there's such a strange and disordered understanding of it. So we have to be careful with that. And if there's going to be obedience required, then this is going to have to be approved properly because otherwise we have no certainty of it. And this is going to cause chaos. And here's where it gets, here's it gets really interesting. You have not only let the smoke of Satan infiltrate into my sanctuary, which is true. Paul VI said that. But you have allowed a whole army of demons to take your places. And you have allowed the usurper to sit on my chair of Peter, he who is carrying out the great treason that will leave my church desolate. Okay. So basically what it's saying here, and I'll repeat that, you have allowed the usurper to sit on my chair of Peter, the chair of my Peter, he who is carrying out the great treason that will leave my church desolate. So the language here is very imprecise. Is the great treason the great apostasy? Is it the great apostasy? If it is, it's the end times, and this is an end times prophecy. And Christ tells us we know neither the hour nor the day. And there have been great saints in the past who believed the end times were coming, who had unmatchable holiness, like St. Jerome, who gave us the, trans the proper translation of the Bible in Latin, which is the Vulgate, which is the standard translation. <clears throat> Excuse me. St. Vincent of Ferrer called himself the Angel of the Apocalypse. He was canonized. He's an incredible saint, one of the greatest in history, and astounding miracles. But that was kind of the point is his life was filled with incredible conversions, miracles, evangelization, coming back to the faith, defeating the Muslims in Spain, that sort of thing, and converting the Jews as well. Um... None of that stuff, so none of those fruits, either in the sense of St. Jerome being um, one of the most important scholars in the history of the church, giving us the correct translation of the Bible in Latin, which has been the basis for the Latin church, which cleared up a lot of errors, or a lot of potential errors that even St. Augustine fell into with his uh, improper translation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's no fruits like that. And St. Vincent Ferrer was performing miracles publicly all the time. There was like 80,000 recorded miracles or something like that. It was insane. We're talking about like levitations, uh, people being crushed by columns of churches falling after thunderous voices from heaven, and then him raising people from the dead, like, you know, big league kind of miracle stuff. None of that is happening here. So if this is an end times prophecy, there is no validation. There is no supernatural validation that can be verified in a miraculous sense that is a, that is visible to anyone. That's a really big problem. If you're going to make big claims, you're going to have to come with big reasons for those claims and big proofs, kind of, you know? And since this idea that Pope Francis is a usurper, and I have no problem with the logic of bishops and popes being usur uh, usurpatious, um, I was just talking to... Uh, why am I forgetting the name? Stephen Mosher, expert on China. We did an interview the other day about the history of communist China and against the faith and so forth. And he told a story of being in China in the basement of a cathedral. And the nuns asked if he wanted to meet the bishop. And he's like, meet the bishop, like this communist patriotic church bishop who's in this whatever. And they said, no, the real bishop. And they brought out this old man who was they recognized as a real bishop. It's possible. It happened in the Aryan crisis. It's happening in China right now. Um, this is why when people condemn Archbishop Lefebvre because he consecrated auxiliary bishops, you have no idea how far other great saints in history have gone in times of crisis, like St. Eusebius of Semisote, for example, literally consecrating bishops and priests and putting them in parishes and dioceses and saying, because the heretics are here, now you're in charge. Archbishop Lefebvre did nothing that far, and they were saints. So think about that for a sec. In any event, I don't have any problem with the idea of bishops and popes being usurpatious. But the main problem here is that the allegation here is that this is from God. This is from God. Therefore, it must infallibly be true. If this is from God, it must infallibly be true. So God is declaring the Sede Vacantis position according to these revelations. Now, I don't condemn Sede Vacantis out of hand. There are some that I have no time for. I have friends, acquaintances, that are... Uh, conscientious state of a contest from their reading they, they've been convinced by the position and i don't think they're schismatics i think there is a way state of a contest leads to a schismatic way because it's a complete rejection of the communion of the faithful in all ways because it's just you're in some non-catholic church you have no val valid priests I, I i think that's schismatic but there are say who hold the position 
attend the sacraments, recognize the Catholicity of others who are, are faithful Catholics, and there's no issue there. They just have a different opinion about what's happening in the crisis in the church, and I'm not going to fault them for it. I, that's my position. I've always stated that. I'm not a sede. I'm not going to be a sede. I've been reading a lot about it lately, and I, there's lots of strong arguments against it that even if I had some doubts, it's not enough to convince me. I'm just being honest. But I don't have a problem with those who fall into the position, and I do have friends and, and, and acquaintances that I respect greatly as intellectuals who do hold that position, and I have no problem with them as persons, and I don't condemn them. I want to make that clear. There's a book by Dr. Kwasniewski's publisher, Os Justi Press. He edited the book. It's a compilation of, I don't know, 100 essays or something, maybe 50 essays, a lot of essays. And they go back and forth about how the church historically has thought about the loss of papal office and things like that. And there's really just not a consensus. It's just not true. So if God is going to be revealing some sort of consensus to that, and then it's got to be verified. Um... So that's a big problem. That's a big problem. That's a really big problem. So after this, this this notion that they were, that they allegedly were told by God that Pope Francis isn't the Pope, that the seat is vacant. After that, they were condemned. This this father and was condemned. Uh, you know, basically suspended. I guess you could say in a technical term by his bishop. Now his bishop is not a very good bishop. Nonetheless, and I'm going to get heat for this because I'm going to talk about obedience as an SSPX guy. There is a realm of obedience. There's a realm of authority wherein conscientious disobedience is appropriate. This has happened in church history. I talk about this a lot in my book, SSPX, The Defense. You can find the link for that book in the description box for this podcast. When the faith itself, the deposit of faith, the transmission of the sacraments and so forth is at stake, there have been great saints in the history of the church who have disobeyed lawful authority because they've obeyed a higher law. This is basic reason. You can drive over the speed limit when you're bringing your wife who is in labor to the hospital. You're breaking the law. You're disobeying the law. But there's a reason for it that makes the law not binding on you in that case. The law doesn't apply in that circumstance because it's not under the purview of that law because it can't fulfill its function. We find this in Scripture. It's talked about in the New Testament and it's, and it's, and it's in the Old Testament where King David and his confreres eat the bread of the presence because they're starving. Not supposed to do that, um, but even in the, in the scriptures, it talks about how there's a, not, we wouldn't say an exception to the law, but there's a, a stipulation that's not covered by the law that wouldn't be foreseen by the authors, essentially. This can happen. And scripture does tell us to obey, to obey God over man. So after these folks were condemned, or this priest was condemned, and I don't think the whole thing was condemned, like all the persons were suspended or something like that, but this priest was suspended, essentially. Get taken, his faculties were taken away. They released some more videos and information saying, we're going to obey God over man. I'm all for obeying God over man. But these private prophecies are problematic, and it's not a matter of the faith, and it has nothing to do with the uh, propagation of the faith throughout the world in any way that is verified by the deposit of faith or the tradition of the church. There's no, there's no valid reason for disobedience in this case. There's just not. Uh, there has been valid reasons, and this is not just my personal opinion. This just doesn't fit. Even Archbishop Lefebvre talked about this. And Archbishop Lefebvre, we're going to, well, we're not going to go to some information from Lefebvre, but we're going to go to some information that I was taught by an SSPX priest about this about the danger of, of private revelations in our lives, private prophecies, if we're not careful, even ones that are beloved by many, many Catholics, many traditional Catholics. There are certain private prophecies and po private revelations that are a big deal because they have universal acclamation and approval by the church, such as Fatima. And they have a very specific call to the universal church, and we must take those very seriously. So we don't dismiss things out of hand as quote-unquote private prophecy. But when we look into the private prophecies and revelations like Fatima, we find that all of the legal requirements are followed by the church. And in many cases, we find that the priests and bishops in charge of these cases are themselves scoundrels, but the process works. This is very important. If we just get into this way of so-and-so is having a message from God, so-and-so is having a message from God, while well, they're condemned by the bishop, but obey God over man, then we really do descend into chaos. 
And that is what's going to happen with this sort of thing. There's this, this, this message from the Divine Mercy mission has turned into, you know, the eclipse is coming, Divine Mercy Sunday is coming, God is going to act, Pope Francis is a usurper, get ready for a big event, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the end times are coming. This is all extremely troubling. Christ is very clear that we know neither the hour nor the day. He does say in the Gospels that when, when the time has come, we will be able to judge that something is happening because like we know the harvest time is coming because of the change of the seasons. But there will be certain signs that will happen that are clear in Scripture. And when that happens, we'll finally know. But Christ says we know neither the hour nor the day. So we can have our inclinations, as many great saints have, like St. Jerome, St. Vincent Ferrer, etc., but we can't declare these things as if they're dogmatic fact and as if they're divinely revealed from God because that would make them infallible. So this, I think, is extremely problematic. Extremely problematic. Also, the divine mercy is a novelty in the church. I'm not going to get into the divine mercy discussion here, but it is a novelty in the church. Divine Mercy Sunday is not, part, it's not traditional. It's not part of the church's history traditionally. It's very novel. So this does seem kind of fishy from that perspective as well, that, well, the big end times, uh, big, the big, the great treason, which maybe the great apostasy is happening, and God's about to right the ship, which may be the end times. By the way, this is all going to be happening in conjunction with Divine Mercy Sunday, so get to it. Also, this priest is condemned by his bishop. Okay, so, and again, the faith is not at stake here. Someone may retort and say, no, the faith is at stake. He's talking about faithless people. Yes, there is a crisis of faith. But the solution to the crisis of faith is not private prophecy. It's prudential action by priests to save souls. You can't save souls with a private revelation. You can save souls with the sacraments. If a priest is suspended and has grave reason to give the sacraments, which has been the case in history, especially with the Society of St. Pius X, they're no longer suspended, by the way, um, anyone who says that is lying. Um, but even when the suspensions were underway, they were not binding because of the grave necessity of, of Catholics receiving their sacraments. No one's receiving their sacraments from this. No priests are being formed from this. The theology of this is very dubious. This is not traditional good Catholic theology that we find in this, and the messages have some ambiguities to it, and God would never be ambiguous. Christ says, neither hot nor cold. You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I spit you out of my mouth. If it's not clear, hot or cold, it's not of God. Yes mean yes, no mean no, etc. So I want to go into history here for a second to show, even with beloved apparitions, which are much more verifiable than this, even there, even when the bishop does approve it, we still don't have a guarantee. So we have a condemnation of a bishop of these private prophecies, again, it's not a matter of the faith, so this idea of obedience does not apply in this sense, in the way that people are thinking it does. No souls are being saved from the actions of this. People may be inspired to go to confession, that's an indirect, but there's no giving of the sacraments, there's no forming of priests, there's no, there's no setting up of orthodox chapels and things like that, which is what we do see the great saints do in history, like during the Arian crisis and Archbishop Lefebvre. This is a completely different thing. So I want to talk here quickly about the very beloved book called The City of God by Maria Dagreda, Maria of Agreda. So I've just pulled up her bio here from the Catholic Encyclopedia. She was in, in, many, ways, in, in many ways a very great saint. Uh, there's verifiable cases of bilocation and things like that. I'm not going to read the biography here, but I just you can look her up. Some of her writings are extremely wonderful and beautiful. I've, I've read some of them before. Okay. So you can look up if you want. She's a great, a great saintly woman in the history of the church. But she wrote a series of books called The Mystical City of God. And those books were condemned by the church. That's going to upset a lot of people. I'm going to show you the evidence of that and why even confusion abounds in this case. So I have some notes I'm going to read here. I want to make sure I read them properly. So she was the superior of a monastery called Immaculate Conception in Agreda, Spain. After a very virtuous life, she died in 1665. Her canonization process started in Rome. 
Um, what made her famous are her writings, in particular, The Mystical City of God, published in 1670, with the approbation of the ordinary. So her local bishop did approve it after her death, but without the approval of Rome, which was requested by Pope Urban VIII in 1625, so 30 years before her death, 45 years, if my math is correct, before her death. Now, the mystical city of God was put by Pope Bless, Blessed Innocent XI on the index in 1681. So about 11 years after its publication. The history is then a little bit more difficult and complicated because when it was put on the index, the kings of Spain made pressure on Rome to allow this to be read in Spanish territories. And that was a conciliation that was made, but it was never approved for the universal church. One of the reasons why this is so beloved and disseminated throughout the North American and Latino world is because of the Spanish influence in our territories. So from the history, we know that it was never approved for the church as a whole. And the, 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 the um, relaxing of the condemnation was for particular political reasons, which sadly is unfortunate. Now, the Franciscans, because she was a Franciscan, tried to carry the cause of her canonization forward and the approval of her book, but the popes never lifted the condemnation of, of Blessed Innocent XI. Clement XIV, a Franciscan himself, imposed eternal silence of the canonization process, propter librum. That's a Latin term about the book. Pius IX, who some say had a personal devotion to it, refused to publish some translations of the mystical city of God after having seen the decree of Clement XIV. Now, why was this book put on the index and never lifted? And please don't say, well, the index no longer exists. This book is not riddled with heresy. Far from it. But there are potential confusions that arise, which was enough for the church to say, because here's the thing. The idea is that the book has God for the author. If that's true, then it must be clearly without error. So we can compare this, for example, to the accepted private revelations of St. Catherine of Siena, in her dialogue and visions, and the instructions of Blessed Angel of Foligno. Um, they have a lower importance in private revelation, public revelation, but they are without error and they've investigated to the nines. And there are other such works. This book couldn't rise to that level of, author of, of, of certainty. So one of the issues... There are many true meditations and beautiful things. I remember citing one of her meditations in my uh, Terror of Demons book because she has this beautiful account about the, the um, traveling to the Holy Land, traveling to, Jerusalem, traveling to Bethlehem by the Holy Family for the Nativity. But there are also her own points of view in there that can't be divinely inspired because they, they, they present potential dangers. But she presents the book as revealed by God. So that's a problem. If it's revealed by God, but we're not certain on certain things, then there's a problem. And she was very saintly, bilocating and like just crazy stuff. None of this is the case with the Divine Mercy mission or mission of Divine Mercy. So we got to put that in perspective. She also wasn't making claims about the end times or the great apostasy or saying who the Pope was or wasn't. The principal cause for the condemnation of this book was on the philosophical level as there are potential errors that can lead to disastrous consequences. The reason is, is because in this book, the philosophy of Duns Scotus, who was a great theologian, but he had an idea about the incarnation, and his idea was that our Lord would have come to the earth and incarnated, even if there was no need for the forgiveness of sin. So if there was never a fall, our Lord would still have come to the earth. And the idea was that he would do that to manifest his glory. Whereas St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, says that would never happen. And the general consensus in the church is that Christ was incarnated specifically for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe Duns Scotus' idea there was officially condemned. It may be, but it doesn't need to be. Because the point being is, even if it's not condemned officially, 
there are other things in there that definitely seem like errors. For example, the idea in the writings of Maria Dagreda are that Our Lady would have entered heaven after her birth, even if Our Lord had not yet opened the gates of heaven. Now, this is a wonderful exaltation of Our Lady, but it's an error philosophically and theologically. So if this book is divine, and this series of books, which contain many beautiful, wonderful things, if they're revealed by God, then Duns Scotus is correct and Thomas Aquinas is wrong. And not just Thomas Aquinas is wrong, but also much of the deposit of faith is, is by extension dubious. The idea that Christ had to come because of the forgiveness of sins and that no one could go to heaven unless he opened the gates of heaven. And this seems to be doubted in the works of Maria Avagreda. Even if it's not explicitly denied in the books, which maybe it's not, even if it's not explicitly denied, the church, looking through these thousands of pages, thousands of pages, many, many thousands, the church decided many, uh, multiple popes for hundreds of years, hundreds of years of the, of the authority of the church, even after it was approved by the bishop, decided that these are potential errors that even if we can't say there's officially a heresy in there, the logic of these on the philosophical level is it will lead to heresy, so it cannot be approved for the universal church. The reason I bring this book up is because the reason I bring this up is because Maria of Agreda was was if if it wasn't for the errors in this would probably be canonized without batting an eye. But even someone who was very saintly and demonstrated that by miraculous events in a life of holiness and virtue, and I will say obedience to her bishop, when you look at the history of how she wrote them down, she was commanded to do so by her confessor and, and, and by the authority over her. So she didn't even demonstrate what's going on here with this mission of divine mercy. And even though she wrote these things down out of obedience, and also, she was a professed religious, so obedience is different for professed religious than lay people. So people always have to understand that. You don't take a vow of obedience as a lay person. Even though she demonstrated all of the aspects of sanctity in her personal life and how she acted, even in that case, there were certain potential errors in the book, and it was condemned. Even if 99.9% .9 of it was true, because of some potential errors in where it would lead, it was deemed not fit for the universal church. And the only reason why there was a conciliation for the Spanish territories was really for political reasons, which was a problem, but the church is full of, of political travesties like that in the past. So if we can say this about this otherwise great saint in the history of the church who demonstrated holiness, sanctity, virtue, miraculous events, obedience to her local, her, her, her confessor, her superior, and so forth, the humble life of a real religious not putting things on YouTube. If we can say this about her works, and the popes have said this about her works, in a time where the papacy was much better than now, then we need to be extremely careful with what's, with what's happening with this missionaries of divine mercy thing, because it does not fit the bill at all. There are, there are red flags from root to fruit with this thing, and the claims are dubious, and the consequences of the claims are chaotic, and... This really needs to be stopped. If we look in the history of the church and how private prophecies and revelations are taken care of, it is not a place where I say, well, God told me, so I'm going to disobey. Again, that didn't happen with St. Athanasius. It didn't happen with St. Eusebius. It didn't happen with Archbishop Lefebvre. It didn't happen with the great bishop from uh, England, Bishop Grossetest who actually went to the Pope and said, you're disobeying Christ. He told that to the Pope himself at a time of corruption in the papacy. It didn't happen with Cardinal Schlippi, um, who um, was a great hero of the Eastern, uh, the G Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, who disobeyed Paul VI and consecrated bishops without his permission. In the East, you don't explicitly need it, but there was a policy of not consecrating. So in that case, he went against the express will of, of Paul VI, under, basically in a secret way. 
And there are reasons for that, for communism, things like that. But the point is, he wasn't supposed to do it, and he did it. And he was made a cardinal by John Paul II. So in the sense of where true obedience is necessary, and we look at some conscientious objectors, let's call it that way, in church history, Eusebius, Athanasius, Cardinal Schlippi, Grossetest, um, Archbishop Lefebvre, and so forth. Many great saints in the Aryan crisis. It's not what's happening here. Furthermore, none of those saints said, well, God told me to do this, so I'm going to do it. That's a surefire problem, because then if God is telling you to do something, then it's infallible. We don't have the right to bind other people under the idea of divine infallibility when the thing is dubious, not approved, and can't be approved, and doesn't match any of the criteria for uh, approval. Um, so many, many issues here from top to bottom, not to mention the contents, which is potentially very dubious. Last thing I want to say is Archbishop Lefebvre, so Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, he actually would talk to his seminarians about the spiritual dangers of getting too deep into private revelations and talking about the works of Maria Vagreda, of um, Maria Valtorta, who wrote The Life of Christ or something, very popular visions on the gospel, and also works like those of N. Catherine Emmerich, which do have some potential errors in them. This is what he said. He said, they represent our Lord in a manner too concrete with all the details of his life. It can be very dangerous not to show enough the face of God in his life, in this life of our Lord, or it can be to show, to not show enough, um, humanizing too much the mystery of the presence of God amongst us. So basically what he's saying is, that translation is a little bit awkward. What he's saying is, He was warning his seminarians of this. There's this tendency to go towards private prophecy and you want to get every single detail of the life of our Lord or Our Lady. But God did not deem it necessary or even advantageous for us to know those things as none of it's in the Gospels. And when there are revelations of our Lord and Our Lady, they're very rare that they're approved and they're very highly vetted and they're accompanied by great miracles. And even in those messages... Fatima, Our Lady of Good Success, Guadalupe, etc. We don't get into the nitty-gritty details of the life of our Lord because as human beings, we have a tendency to bring down the supernatural and naturalize it. We want to bring our Lord down to our level and we want to know things about his physical person that we don't need to know. The Gospels have a lot of silence about the life of our Lord and that is how God willed it for us in the Holy Scriptures. When something brings us into a mentality that is contrary to that, and again, I'll repeat what Archbishop Lefebvre said here, talking about revelations by Agrida, Valtorta, Emmerich, and so forth, they represent our Lord in a manner too concrete, humanizing too much the mystery of the presence of God among us. It really takes away from the divinity and exalts the humanity, which if we're not careful... This is the type of thinking that does lead to some of the great heresies in the church. And last thing I'll say, the mentality that, well, God told me, so now I'm going to go rogue. This is a Protestant mentality. I hate when traditionalists are called Protestants. It's a laughable thing when Novus Ordo defenders will call a traditionalist Protestant. It's like, really? Have you ever been to the Novus Ordo? Have you read the theology of the last 60 years in the church? Goodness gracious. But there is that, but really, Martin Luther is, God told me that I'm going to start this thing. And there's a thousand different, you know, 40,000 different Protestant churches. And we do see a, a thing like this in Catholicism where God has told me the end times are coming. I must be consecrated a bishop. That, that happens. That's one of the dark sides of what happens in traditional Catholicism, when certain people get weird, get too in their heads, get too into prophecy. And it brings with it huge problems. 
and it always leads to disaster. It always leads to financial impropriety. It always leads to sexual immorality, or there's already sexual immorality present. It always leads to cultish mentality and so on and so forth. None of these are indicative of the danger of, of traditional Catholicism or of true private prophecy. They're indicative of the abuse of those good things to the unsuspecting public. Pray for this priest that he just stops talking, that he just doesn't do this anymore. The world is not going to end. There's not going to be the warning or the illumination of conscience or the three days of darkness or whatever on the eclipse. It doesn't really matter if a bunch of towns named Nineveh are under the eclipse. A lot of towns are named Nineveh in the United States. Anyway, it's a big issue. Stay away from this thing. It's not of God. It can't be. There's theological errors. There's errors in, in practice. It doesn't match the history of the church. And even with great saintly heroes of Spanish Catholicism like Maria Dagreda, bilocating and evangelizing natives in the New World, even there, because there are potential errors in philosophy or theology, condemned by the church for centuries. But this fella has a YouTube channel, God is Speaking to the Seers. Pope Francis is a usurper. The great treason is upon us. The end is nigh, etc., etc. Not of God. Real big problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a blessed Triduum. Also, thank you to my friend Enoch Fawaz for that song. I swear, I had allergies. That's why my eyes were misty-eyed. It had nothing to do with my emotions, you know. Haha. Ha. What a what a beautiful thing. Christ was crucified by our for our sins by us and the Jews. Um now this brings us full circle. It's Holy Week, and people are thinking about the apocalypse and the eclipse, the usurpation of Pope Francis. They're thinking about all these things which are not part of the teaching of the church, and they're distracted. This, to me, is demonic because we should be thinking about what my friend said in his song that Christ was crucified because of our sins. That's what we should be focusing on right now, not some unapproved, condemned private prophecies that have no validity. As always, ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.